Welcome, welcome to another episode of Pop Culture Petri Dish, uh, which is a podcast where we talk about sci-fi and sci-non-fi. Uh, I'm Abe Epperson. And I'm Christian Ramirez. Welcome to the show. Uh, so what are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about uh, economies. This one is something that they kind of explore in a few different um, a few different sci-fi things, but it's something that's really important and like the economy kind of underlies everything in whatever sci-fi that you want to think about. Um, whether it's like aliens where they're it's literally the Wayland Yutani corporation that's sending them out on these missions. Mm -hmm. Or like, um, uh, there's a few that, let me get into some examples of the economies that um, are prevalent in some of the sci-fi that we're talking about. These are like some of the more interesting ones that I was able to find. Um, they have wormhole travel and commonplace terraforming and planets that have unique goods. Like one planet produces butter bugs, which uh, host a microbial suite that produces a non-perishable, quote, perfect food. So... Basically, that's the kind of um, stuff that I went for was stuff that mm -hmm. was a specific enough reason for there to still be a trade economy within that universe. And like we talk about, um, I'll probably talk, we'll talk about Dune a little bit, which basically spices magic and it only comes from what, one planet? Yeah, Arrakis. Yeah. And it. And so spice it has gives people the magical ability to navigate through space. So that's another one that's kind of that's a little more. I feel like that one's kind of forced with mm -hmm. the the scarcity of one specific um, commodity. Yeah. So that's just a monopoly on yeah. space travel. Yeah. The navigation trance. Yeah. Uh, and it's some magical concoction uh -huh. between the the spice worms mm -hmm. and uh, the sand, the spice properties of the plant itself. Yeah. Uh, because they can't do it on any other planet. Um, and yeah, you mentioned the one which I'm not even going to try to say <laughs> earlier. You said one planet produces butter bugs, yeah. <laughs> which is a perfect food. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, what is this? What is this fucking saga that this guy wrote where he's like, what is the name of the perfect food? <laughs> Let's just take some butter, throw some bugs in it, bing bang. <laughs> or the bugs are butter. You Maybe the bugs going. are made out of butter. <laughs> I hope it's bug butter. Uh, From all that bug milk. Yeah. Um, but in both of these cases, so one is more of a, it sounds like one is more of a, has one major export and you import yeah. everything else, which is straight up, you know, League of Nations shit. Yeah. yeah. But with Dune, it's just like for a very particular um, industry, namely the most lucrative one, which is space, space travel. travel yeah. It is entirely run by one, uh, by the Baron Harkonnen and that yeah. family, right? Yeah. And it's like a corporation, kind of like Whalen uh, in Alien is yeah. like akin to that, right? Yeah, it's just maybe not as strong of a stranglehold on the actual product. Right. But it's pretty clear in the alien mythos that the whaling industries is basically has control of all of the best tech. Right. No one else is just fucking off to space <laughs> just because they yeah. can. Um, so, yeah, that seems to be both capitalistic yeah. endeavors. Yeah. And that's like uh, in Star Wars. Um, I'll reveal a little bit of my nerdy ex extended universe knowledge on this one. There's like the Corellians make their entire economy is based on making starships and like, um, the stuff in, where was it? Bespin is mining gas that is specifically for starships. And it's these authors coming up with a way that we can have interstellar and interplanetary travel, but still somehow maintain capitalism because somehow us leaving capitalism is more unbelievable than like warp drives and mm -hmm. magically navigating the, the stars with the navigation trance in Dune. And I think like that's super like backwards mm -hmm. 
I, I think that the only way that we're going to become spacefaring and like travel interstellar distances is if we like as a society first decide no we can't really do this with capitalism and then we all collectively like put our resources toward um, exploring and colonizing and that kind of stuff <clears throat> right right that, i mean that's how star trek right proposes is that the federation the, all of the humans they abolish money sure just this idea of like notoriety mm -hmm. uh enlightenment the idea of bettering oneself yeah. um would be it's a reputation based based economy, economy yeah and yeah. because all these people grew up not having money or caring about uh, material mm. things that's all fine and good <laughs> that's a great utopia <laughs> uh but how they I don't know if they wrote a lot about how they got through like things like the tragedy of the commons sure. or, you know, other eth or other ethical slash economic kind yeah. of delivery systems for achieving prosperity yeah. uh, because there's so many negative effects. The other thing I want to mention about Star Trek, which is just clearly just writer stuff. Like it's just <laughs> yeah. like, we want to make an interesting race, mm -hmm. but, um, like the, the Ferengi, Ferengi <laughs> nothing makes sense to me about them. <laughs> I mean, all the way down to their earlobes. We talked about like why, why is we talked about that in the sex episode, <laughs> yeah. anything that you do, like any, if you have a big horn on your face, you're like that horn is involved in fucking. <laughs> uh, but anyway, past the organism itself, uh, latinum is what they use sure. and it's gold press latinum. Okay. And I was reading about it last night because I had fucking nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, and I read that it, it, latinum is made only in like nebula okay. and supernovas. Okay. So it's a super dense, but that's not how, that's just atoms. Yeah. <laughs> that's just a really state, like a stable, like advanced, like very high yeah. amount of neutrons kind of stuff. Atom, yeah. Which means that. That you can make it. You can make it <laughs> in a replicator. <laughs> in a replicator, and then someone on the extended universe was talking about how no, that they actually wrote around that. A few people tried, you know, took a stab. <laughs> a few writers <laughs> took a stab, and the the one that a lot of people agree on is that uh, it's just too unique. Yeah. Of like, uh, like it, the combination is too unique, and like the buffer system, like. Replicators can only do simple processes. Sure. Even like things like food, which yeah. has like, you know, it's all about, I guess, the jazz of the kitchen <laughs> where you're, you're just like sauteing those, you know, fucking scallops or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, ah, but I can't replicate this. Well, you just don't understand writers yeah. of Star Trek. The <laughs> idea of it's a chemical process, yeah. which involves compounds and atoms. Yeah. The way in which you cook it. Yes. There's probably... I don't know, like, but like, like the heat amount and sure. stuff like that. But heat all this pressure. stuff is all chemical based, uh, like atomic based elements are sure. involved. It's not like this magic kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and you would think that like a repl replicator would have an easier time replicating one, one single element right. rather than something as complex as like the food that we eat, yeah. which is several different elements all combined to make whatever it is. The other that thing that consuming. they were talking about is that latinum is, is a, is a liquid. Okay. And they had to put it in bars to make it like they mix it with gold or <laughs> yeah. something like that. Or I don't know. That just seems like when whoever was in charge of like, what's the <laughs> best thing for money? Like I feel like there's not many trajectories, much unlike uh, unlike our own yeah. development of how currency worked. We're like right. shiny thing, cool, give you shiny thing, and then we're like, <laughs> wait, shiny things kind of hot, tough to come by, and there's like some shiny things are bigger than other shiny things. I have an idea. <laughs> Let's just use these little tiny coins that represent the shiny thing. Are they shiny? Yes, but not as much. <laughs> but remember, they represent the shiny thing. And then we're like, okay, well, then it doesn't matter. We don't need to make this out of, like, sh the shiny thing. We can just yeah. set, make it out of cotton or mm -hmm. something like that or just 
zinc, something that's we have a ton of. And they're like, no, the thing that we love is this super expensive thing, and <laughs> it's hard to use. Yeah. So we have to do like crazy processes to it just to get the thing we want, mm -hmm. which is bars of whatever. It can be fucking <laughs> clay for all we know. Yeah. Yet they're obsessed with the shit. I think once again, it's probably a sex thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is one thing that while I was doing my research, not a lot of economists were talking about the economy of sex in the, <laughs> yeah. the sci-fi universe. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Those poor sex workers in Starfleet. <laughs> but I mean, I guess, but that actually does kind of bring up a good point that a lot of the reason why capitalism is like our main mode of uh, our uh, main engine of our economy is because we have that like ape brain part of us mm -hmm. the part that is shiny thing good uh -huh. that i want more things because if i have more things yeah then i'm better yeah the accumulation of things has right. always been like status yeah. relevant mm -hmm. uh, as long as you know but we've kicked our programming before you know yeah yeah, yeah of course you know i don't but it's still there but you we make things like laws, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I really want to kill him. Well, then you get this. I don't want that. Well, cost benefit analysis, buddy. Uh, so, and like uh, one of the key terms that I was, when I was looking and in, into this, uh, one of the most important things that throughout all of this is the idea of a post scarcity economy, mm -hmm. which, um, is basically means we don't, want for anything or we don't there's none of our needs that aren't fulfilled through right. that economy right. and um so there's a few different ways that theoretically we could get to it um one of them is speculative technology like replicators mm -hmm. because if you have replicators and you can replicate food and whatever and people don't need anymore they don't mm -hmm. they no longer have to worry about where their food's coming from another one is digital abundance which basically Digital abundance um, contributes to everybody being able to learn more and have more access to information. And um, so we all become our own individual like drivers of the economy, the, meaning that we can program robots and do maintenance and stuff like that, that the automation will take care of the rest of our lives. And we work like 10 hours a week and then every, the rest of our time is devoted to whatever we want to pursue. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's kind of where the digital abundance comes from. We'd have robots doing everything for us and almost everything, most things for us. And we would no longer have any needs that weren't being fulfilled. So yeah, that's kind of the three of the three main methods of getting to a post scarcity economy that I found that I was looking at. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting and probably a lot bigger than what we would, um, we could tackle in any podcast, sure, sure. you know, not that, that we are selfish by co like completely selfish by nature and non altruistic. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that like at a certain point, like let's say we both worked on a thing, like we yeah. both wrote a novel together yeah, yeah. and I secretly felt, and I never told you because I felt that it would ruin, you know, the thing that we had that I worked harder on it than yeah. you did or vice versa. There would be that unwelcome remainder of that. Like, I feel like I was essentially ripped off or mm -hmm. something like that because we get equal notoriety. Right. So they would have to have some kind of legislative body that goes over the grief of that, like inconsistent sure. subjective situation. Yeah. But, that's fast tracking to Star Trek. Hopefully it's just yeah. like maybe over time we evolved so that it's just like, yeah, you, I, I don't lie. I just don't need <laughs> yeah. to lie anymore. I don't care about lying. And it's just like, oh shit. Well then, yeah, then that's, that's a big problem out of the way. If no one's lying. Um, there's something that I, I, I just wanted to finish that thought and yeah. feel free to jump in yeah. and say more about it. But like, uh, I always like to go to back to history and um, it was popularized, I guess, for me in the HBO John Adams mm -hmm. uh, show, <laughs> but it's actually from a letter uh, to Abigail Adams. Okay. And uh, I, I just like it. It says that uh, it's a quote. I must study politics and war 
that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, ge geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, and stage right. work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, that's obviously written by, like, a... <laughs> In a world by a man, like a white man who uh, <laughs> essentially had the right to vote to a woman who did not, you know, like, and like, he's like, I got this shit all figured out. Uh, and he's saying like, this is what's going to happen with my grandparents. So that's a whole, or grandchildren. That's a whole different, like psychological study with itself, the, his need to say that. <laughs> sure. But I do think that there's some relevance in the quote in that he, this guy is kind of understanding that like. We have to baby steps this shit. Yeah. You know, we have to study like in kind of the reverse to make our economy more like global or to see ourselves as global citizens. Right. We must do away with different aspects yeah. of things. Like right now, I think we have a cultural moment about pointing out injustice. And I think injustice yeah. will not be, uh, you know, we will not beat justice in my lifetime sure. but then maybe the next generation will be able to call it out with more consistency and yeah. uh, people stop wanting to be unjust to each other mm -hmm. and then generations after that and that before you know they're all Riker in Alaska tooting <laughs> on his trumpet not caring about money yeah uh, so yeah I think that that's I think that's what the job of science fiction is yeah uh, looking at the machine as it is now. Mm -hmm. I think there's, we're so complicated as a species because we have this concept of the people that are older. And this is kind of ingrained in us, not just through society of respecting your elders, but also just because of the fact that, um, when we were, when we were struggling to survive, if somebody made it to the age of 70 something, mm -hmm. it was because they understood something about survival that we didn't. So we needed to listen to them. But that also has the side effect of creating a lot of social problems <laughs> because sometimes the ways of thinking that um, older generations have aren't constructive and they, and they aren't going to actually get us to a place where um, it's making the world better anymore. and But we have that instilled in us that this person has made it this far. We need to understand and respect all of the things that they have to say. And that's not me saying that. And obviously, we do need to respect a lot of the things that older people have to tell us. Not necessarily when it comes to things like science, when it comes to things that they don't actually have a strong understanding of because the world is evolving at such a pace that the human brain over a hundred year span isn't necessarily going to be able to keep up with right. the world. In a, in other words, any new frontier. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like let's ask grandma what she thinks about robotics. Mm. <laughs> She's probably racist somehow. <laughs> There's a quote I for, I'm gonna misattribute it, so I don't know. So I'll just paraphrase yeah. it. But just this thought of um, the second that we stopped enslaving other people mm -hmm. and started enslaving fossil fuels, mm -hmm. uh, we became a more ethical people. Yeah, uh, because we stopped doing slavery <laughs> and instead abused fossil fuels. And now the next step is like we should not be relying on fossil fuels because mm -hmm. there's you know. There's a ledger there too mm -hmm. in terms of injustice <laughs> and how it like, you know, gives people cancer or yeah. destroys the earth. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have to do these kind of, we have to like pivot to new things. Yeah. And one of those things that might be if we want that 10 hour day where all we do is just fucking play music yeah. <laughs> uh, or whatever and just be chill as fuck. Uh, <laughs> we would probably be very reliant on things like robots. We'd yeah. be reliant and we'd make them our slaves. Yeah. Uh, and so we would, we would outsource all the things that pe you know, are dangerous and stuff like that. And then the next step of that generation would be what robots rights, you know, yeah. like there's a lot of different, <laughs> like, I, I don't think there's any one way to skin an economy. Sure. Uh, with humans. Yeah. I think that economy is 
of all type and of all conception are inherently yeah. broken because we are broken. Yeah, <laughs> that is my personal belief. I no, yeah, if I it was writing a, lot... a science fiction. That was, <laughs> it was what it would be. It would be a lot more simple if we, if it was robots in control, if mm-hmm. it was robots running a robot society, because they would have answers of like where does consciousness begin and where does automation end? Yeah, like that kind of stuff, and. And I think that is going to be a question that we have to answer once we start using robots for the majority of the the grunt work. Um, yeah, like what are the what are the um, obviously that this is kind of what Dune's about. Yeah, is we don't stop and ask the spice worms if we can like just take all their spice. Right? Maybe they like rolling around in it and stuff. <laughs> like I don't know what <laughs> worms like, uh, but like the what the Muad'Dib and uh, the free the Freeman. Yeah. Uh, the guys with the blue yeah, eyes yeah. and stuff like that. Those Arrakis sand and Arrakis spice belongs on Arrakis. Yeah. Which is kind of like a grassroots. Re- we love our revolutions. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, look, most of our sci-fi, we are the the gritty upstart from you know the the pale blue dot in the Milky Way <laughs> galaxy. We love yeah. that narrative. We're telling people, all right, let's all be like this big like earth <laughs> machine let's be a, like a yeah. like a some kind of sphere and maybe make ourselves cyborgs you know what let's come make it a cube because uh, that was another good point about the economic economics of star trek uh paper that the, yeah. you were talking about which is an ec- economist i believe it yeah was yeah like, um, uh, what's really interesting is that the federation and the borg are the most to like they're very alike yeah because they have singular vision they're explorers they're trying to better themselves yeah like that is their mo Mm -hmm. their prime directive um so to speak although you know we have a very bipolar problem with uh prime directives because our prime (laughs) directive is like we first do no harm don't fuck up you know like because we could fuck up an entire civilization yeah but we do it all the time in the show (laughs) Uh, you know so it's like yeah it's we are the pro like to me the borg are the ones who are like (laughs) at least we're consistent yeah i'm not saying we're moral or ethical i'm just saying (laughs) consistent wise the borg are more consistent oh and the economist's name is uh manu sadia it was a wired article called the economic lessons of star trek's money-free society yeah um yeah and I don't know. It's so hard for us to conceive of getting to post scarcity, but we're already kind of there with a lot of the things that we need. We're just at such an economic imbalance as far as who controls the resources. Uh, because so we you're talking have, about like food and yeah, water and Because right now yeah. we have enough food. We have enough food to take care of everybody. No, there's not a reason why anybody should go hungry in the mm-hmm. United States. Mm-hmm. Never. Because we produce a, such a surplus that we can feed people with the food that we throw away. Yeah. Like that that by itself is enough to cover anybody who's hungry. Um, and we, through other means, through GMOs and through um, advanced farming techniques, we can feed the whole world if we really want to, if we want to put our minds to it. And as of right now, we probably could fix our dependency on oil if we really wanted to. Mm. But because of the fact that we are founded upon a capitalized society, all of that is made more difficult because we have money being put towards politics and things like that. And so I think basically first we need to overcome stuff like that before we can ever think about getting to a truly post need society uh, because as long as there's people that are going to benefit from hoarding more of whatever mm-hmm. resource it is, then they're going to try to do that and they're going to use whatever resources yeah. they already have to accomplish that goal. Yeah. And the, um, you can't work under the assumption that like out of the sky will arrive an alien daddy right. <laughs> who, who will t- he'll be like, Oh, little buddies, I'm going to teach you all, all, like all the technology where nothing matters anymore. And you can just fly around on your yeah. spaceship. With Cause me. that is how it happened in star yeah. Trek. It was, they invented warp drive. I think they discovered warp drive and who was it? The, who it was Spock's. the Vulcans. Yeah. The Vulcans yeah. were 
found out that we discovered it and they're like, all right, here's all this technology. <laughs> now yeah. you don't have to worry anymore. By the way, that was in a, what was that in? That was in, um, yeah. uh, first contact with James Cromwell. And, uh, <laughs> and I love it. It's because they made it out to be like, who are the aliens going to be? Who is it going to be? And it just like walks out and you're like, okay, so it's a Ron Hiller <laughs> Vulcan. And then they do the live long and prosper. And it's just like, it's played to the swelling music. Like, it's like, Oh shit, mic drop. <laughs> and I'm like, they've been there since the beginning. I mean, it frankly makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's not like a twist. <laughs> the, the whole time we were Vulcan or some shit, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. And how long were they watching us kill each other before well, they, they just decided had to wait? To, they, sure. That they taught us the prime directive. Right. So they, either they or someone who taught them created this idea of like, all right, what's the barrier of when we can talk to them and right. let them know we exist when they achieve warp drive. Yeah. And the second that there's like a warp signal, they're like, oh shit, now we can talk to you. Yeah. And to me, that just seems like, I don't know, such a kind of high and shitty way to look at things. Because if you had talked to us when we were just people farming mm -hmm. or that when we were hunter gatherers, if you had come down and said, hey, we can mold this society to where nobody ever suffers mm -hmm. instead of waiting for billions and billions of people to die in yeah. wars and stuff like that. Well, have you read <laughs> Childhood's End? Uh, no. That's the idea is that... Um, they we were molded by sure uh, a race to make us the best version that we can like an experiment yeah to make ourselves better better than they are yeah uh they're like we saw that you had emotion and we don't have emotion mm -hmm. and we saw how emotion was playing out in your history because we have the ability to do that and it which is kind of like a rival you yeah. know that you know where they they ha just have the ability the the hectopods have the ability yeah. to see time as All like at a, once. you know time as a circle uh <laughs> but the crazy thing about that book is also uh it is revealed that it's it's a spoiler but it's not like the end of the book spiral spoiler yeah. um you can also watch the tv show they made a mini series about it the aliens look like the de the devil Oh, okay. And so that's why the devil and demons are in our uh, in our mythos, yeah, that's in our, cool. our tales. Yeah. Because that's just what they happen to look like. Yeah. yeah. They're not evil, uh, mm -hmm. but it does bring up the ambiguity of like if we could mold someone. Yeah. I mean, how far is that from eugenics, really? Right. That's true. You know, just by saying we are better than they are. Why? Because look, we, we're spacefaring. <laughs> or look, we're just more moral. We're, we, we solved economies. Yeah. Well, is that the criterion of how we determine what a good civilization is? Is whether or not they have an economy? That's true. Uh, who's to say? Yeah, that's true. a real the, question. There's a because there's an impossible philosophical debate debate over the merits of in a society that is spacefaring and interstellar that obviously has much greater technology than us. They have much more experience than we do with travel and seeing other parts of the universe mm -hmm. is our human morality going to be something that is more important or less important when it comes to that kind of a thing because i think from, i think it's a simple question i don't think it's an impossible question i think it's simple it's do you value autonomy or not because well yeah because that's also the question where does autonomy end when it comes right. to them molding us as a society if they give us the tools to like okay you're never going to want for anything again yeah do whatever you're going to do is that the limit or is it somewhere closer to all right we're going to stop you from ever having wars with each other yeah we're not going to let people suffer because of whatever whatever reason mm -hmm. then i guess that kind of that seems like we don't have autonomy anymore, but right. we can live within that structure however we want to. Mm -hmm. We're already, just by the laws of nature, we live within those laws in whatever way that we want to, pretty much, without right. breaking them. So how much, like, is autonomy <laughs> a thing that really exists? Because we can't, obviously, we can't break the laws of nature. We can't go past past the speed of light. We can't do those kinds of things. They're limited resources. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if, like, speed is a resource, they're yeah. limited resources. Exactly. From our, what we can see. Yeah. 
So I don't know. Um, I think though, I don't know. I, I just feel like if they're watching world war one and two, maybe they step in before there's a third one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, like, there seems like chill out for, guys. for all my waxing poetic about like the philosophies of both sides and like, yeah. in the end, it's just like, you guys space Nazis. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we love being space Nazis. Like kill these motherfuckers. <laughs> they're space Nazis. Yeah. So there's obvious solutions to obvious questions, yeah. but not all the questions are obvious. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> space Nazis is pretty cut and dry. <laughs> what the fuck are butter bugs? <laughs> Who do you think got it right? And by that, I think that there's two questions in that, mm. and you can answer either or both. One, what is like a reasonable expectation? Mm -hmm. Who got it right versus like who got who created the best economic system? Oof. That's okay. I think we're slowly figuring out that there aren't many people or there weren't many science fiction writers that considered the fact that for us to become an interstellar or um, interplanetary race, we kind of have to get rid of capitalism first. Mm. Like that has to be the first step. Otherwise, I, otherwise it is a Wayland Yutani situation. It's mm. just the corporations that are, are the ones that are out that are the only ones that are able to go travel through space. Because and this the is the assumption that we have to do it all entirely ourselves. That right. we can like, yeah, I'm let's not assuming say there's there was like aliens. a trade coalition, like in star Wars, yeah. the best part of star Wars, everyone agrees <laughs> the trade federation uh, <laughs> where they come in and they go like, Oh shit. Like yeah. the earth, it, it, we have a spice. Like, yeah. it's like, they're like, we love your dust. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> All right, like give us all of your dust, and yeah. we'll give you everything. We love, we want to just roll on your dust, like so many spice worms. Um, so you know that could be yeah. a capitalist based, sure. uh, you know, thing. Uh, but so you're saying you believe that we, you don't think we can become spacefaring at all without with capitalism in the mix. But the abolishing of money is important to a spacefaring society because we have to put all of our effort towards becoming spacefaring. Mm. And if that's the only industry, if for us to only have one industry, then I don't see how we can do that with there being people with a ton of resources, a ton of money and be there being other people that don't have almost anything. There has to be some kind of equalizing of that pressure. Otherwise it is corporate space travel. Yeah. It, it kind of has to be, uh, if we want to do it faster and together at the same time, yeah, we kind of, the bill has to kind of be all of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, like there's no tip. It's mm -hmm. just, <laughs> what is the cost of the meal? Every piece of wealth that yeah. we have, we can muster that is relevant. Yeah. Because we, we can't have people hoarding gold because we need gold to, make solar sails or whatever it is mm -hmm. that we need because mm -hmm. gold and silver have applications to a lot of technology that yeah. we have. We need, we need to build robotics. We need to figure out distribution of, uh, right. uh, of food and water so that we can get more workers. Mm -hmm. building we can't have spaceships. Nestle hoarding water. <laughs> yeah. We can't like it's <laughs> education needs to be free so that yeah. any brain one particularly down the line that's suited to developing warp drive yeah. is not yet another sad tale of someone who never matched their potential yeah, because, because they didn't have the money poor or, yeah. you know, because they died from a medical yeah. condition. Well, and that's where that um, concept that I talked about earlier and just having access to that information in the first place is so helpful to our society because somebody that's poor, that, you just have to have internet access. You can go to a Starbucks. You just need a phone now at this point right. to access that kind of information. <clears throat> and if all of the information and like education and stuff like that was free to anyone, then that maximizes our chances of finding the person who is able to put together a warp drive. Mm -hmm. It's 
because as of right now, it's only if you're able to afford college and if you're able to afford taking on massive amounts of debt to mm-hmm. go to college so you can try to help the world. <laughs> Did you hear about the guy in like the eighties who developed like since he was a kid or something like that? He was uh, he was developing a thorium car in his garage, <laughs> I and it like hear totally worked. This. And then some somehow someone figured it out and was like the like <laughs> army would came up and was like, dude, you can't just build <laughs> nuclear reactors. And he had the best response, which was, why not? <laughs> it's like, because if it's not safe, he's like, check it. I followed every code. Yeah. That, like I did my research yeah. and I do exactly what, like I should be certified, but you're not certified. <laughs> well, are you certified? So who, how do you have the ability to judge me? <laughs> well, let's get someone who's certified and we need to like put a stamp on this. We all need to know. And I'm like, that's, he's like, that's fair. I made a car. <laughs> If it exploded, I would have died. Yeah. I wouldn't like have killed everyone. <laughs> it's just like, but just people doing like kind of uh, under the radar kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that should happen more because that also allows people information sure. to like the ways and means and like the fact that everyone's going to get internet means that you, you kind of have to agree that you're going to get the, you know, yeah. white the negative part of it too. and yeah. stuff are going to try to use that f- to build weapons. Well, how do you stop? How do you keep that digital abundance from becoming actual yeah. abundance of things that we don't want, like yeah. hatred or bombs? Um, yeah. And the answer is, you. Yes, you I, I still feel that it's still working the same way. You just have yeah. to craft essentially what we think is a better version of ourselves, yes. which I think is a slightly different conversation than another civilization walking in and trying to craft our civilization to be it absolutely. because there's just something unique about being a human in the yeah. human race, determining and living in that struggle and enjoying the wealth of that. And at the same time, being able to enforce your yeah. particular opinion onto someone else that that should be overseen, yeah. but it's not, it's a lot different from like some fucking space bugs coming in and yeah. saying, give us your bones, you know? <laughs> But yeah, and that is, that's a part that not a lot of sci-fi authors or creators of sci-fi really address because I guess there's kind of an inherent assumption that we're going to move past racism and things like that naturally. Mm -hmm. And it's just a part of, like, it's a hardware issue. Like we've talked about in other episodes that when it comes to space travel, humans have a hardware issue. We don't have the ability to go vast distances right now because mm-hmm. we are made of meat and we are, we just can't do it. And there is parts of us that that tribalism part of us that exists. And there's, unless we have precogs saying that people <laughs> are about to commit crimes <laughs> and we have that kind of stuff going on, then we, we don't really have the ability to stop that, but we can, do things like legislate for it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, but I do think the idea that we will move past hatred and stuff like that, that could be a nice side effect of living in a post scarcity world. Because mm-hmm. if we don't, if we're not competing for our basic needs, then we do kind of have that opportunity to, to worry less and to be concerned with the reasons why we are not, things aren't working out for us. We don't need to worry about that yeah. anymore. I've always assumed that the reason that people want to standardize uh, the wealth situation of everyone on the planet is because they wanted everyone to have the same experience with economy sure. to essentially say that I grew up in a house that looked much like yours that had yeah. a, a sink much like yours that when it was broke was fixed mm-hmm. I never had to suffer not having water or I never yeah. had to suffer not having food and then to look across the aisle and be like you there over there like I'm a white male you know yeah. you're Latino like if if we we both are Americans yeah. that makes us very similar were we not, if we could look across the aisle and say like, there's someone, there's someone who looks completely different than I am, but I know that they had the same experience. Of yeah. me. Now, of course, that is the question of liberty and autonomy yeah. because now it's like, cool. So now there is a system that has almost de systemized hatred. Yeah. At least on a, like a poverty on a wealth. Yeah. Yeah. On like the things a that we way can that control. Make, like the class system has been disrupted. Yeah. Great. 
also what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> what kind of stories do you like to yeah. be told? What, you know, like, are we going to assume that in that nature nurture thing, that nurture is going to be all the way standardized? Yeah. Are, is our nature going to be all the way standardized as well? Well, no. Yeah. I mean, there's parts about your culture that I don't understand and sure. yours that you don't understand in mine that I'm eager to understand and yeah. likewise. And it's like, there's also parts that are like, I, I know something about it, but I, I'm, I'm ignorant to living it. Yeah. And it's just like, that's kind of the spice of life kind of yeah. stuff. And like, I understand <laughs> why that, why there's that, um, that, that, that soundbite wisdom comes from the right and left all the time. Sure. It's like, See, no, everyone wants to be the same, but we're also different and we should celebrate yeah. both. But, you know, vote for me because I got the right combination of the two, baby. <laughs> you know, do you like a little bit more peanut butter or a little less jelly? Yeah. I got the right one that you want. That does, I mean, it brings up the valid idea and kind of criticism on the philosophy that I was talking about is if we all as a society and a world decide that we are all going to work together for a singular goal. What does that do to the culture and the diversity and stuff like that? Does it not homogenize it as well? Like, do we not lose out on some of that stuff when everybody is given the exact same things? Depends on how, how addicted we get to that change. Right. You know, because if we see it start working and we're like, no one's murdering each other. Yeah. This is fucking great. Yeah. Then we're going to be like, I'm, let's double down. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, like, I, honestly, there's a bunch of stuff like, let's get rid of alcoholics. Yeah. <laughs> while we're at it. Yeah. <laughs> Change this shit, too. Yeah. You know what? It'll be a lot easier if we're all just hard drives. <laughs> And bada bing, bada boom. Hey, the one thing that we know about the Matrix is universal health care. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You got everything you need right in a pod. Right in a pod. Right in your holes. <laughs> just holes go. Just tubes going into holes. Yep. Make it good. <laughs> My robot family. All right. Uh, uh, I don't have anything. I have many other things to say about. I know this we could topic. talk about economics but, um, for a long time. You know, well, I think that we like the only thing I've re I had left I really have to say about this is that we are kind of at that moment right now and we're going to decide either as a human race to tackle climate change mm. and survive or to fight each other about it and die because well, not all of us will die. Just those of us that don't have the money to survive. Third option, fight the sun. <laughs> But yeah, so son, I'll see you at dawn <laughs> at high noon pistols. But yeah, there are some definitely some things that have to change for the majority of us to survive this upcoming climate disaster that I mean, there's no other real way to put it like it'll it'll change the way that the earth that humans function on the earth forever if we don't take care of it. Yeah. Because that's that part of our nature that we we do have the thing where we want more stuff than the other person next to us. That's that we, true. Yeah. And we got to overcome that or else mm. <laughs> or else things are going to fucking suck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Real bad. Yeah. But, you know, give me your stuff, though. <laughs> Christian, I'm not recording. Just give me your stuff. <laughs> Well, then that wraps that one up. We got more in the pipeline coming for you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. And bye-bye. Bye. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, everybody. Swaim here. With added excitement in my voice because it might equate to money for me. Uh, I just wanted to officially let everyone know through the medium of audio rather than tweets that Small Beans has a merch store now. Yeah, that's right. And this is not just some cash grab with the logos of our shows, although you can get logo tees there if you'd like. We worked very hard with several very talented artists to really present you with shirts and buttons and content to come that we really think is worth your purchase and you're going to enjoy. And if you're someone who hasn't been able to patronize us, this is a fantastic way to support Small Small beans directly without having to sign up for patreon and of course you get a physical item in return rather than just our glorious glorious content which will remain free but is not free to make so we'd really appreciate anyone who's willing to check out the sb merch store it is at smallbeans.bigcartel.com and there you will find a bunch of hilarious shirt designs some limited edition
subscription buttons, as well as an ever-increasing amount of audio content to download. We're talking original rap songs, audiobook versions of short stories, and so on. And we're always brainstorming and trying to add new things to the shop, but we'll stop if no one goes there. So please check it out, smallbeans.bigcartel.com. And as always, we love you!